This is Agriculture Today, and I'm Samantha Bennett with the K-State Radio Network. We begin today's show by continuing our conversation from last week on carbon credits with K-State postdoctoral fellow Micah Cameron Harp and K-State professor of agricultural economics Nathan Hendricks. This week, they discuss the policy surrounding carbon markets and where they see markets like this going in the future. We are also joined today by associate professor in the K-State College of Veterinary Medicine and certified veterinary pharmacologist, Brian Lubers. He joins us to discuss the upcoming June 11th FDA regulation changes for antimicrobials and shares how these changes will affect producers and veterinarians alike. Fly season is almost here. K-State Dairy Specialist Mike Brook ends today's show encouraging dairy farmers to begin implementing control measures now to reduce adult fly populations later this spring and summer. That and more is coming up ahead on Agriculture Today. Agriculture today, and you are tuned back in now to a continuation of a conversation we had really last week. We're joined again by Micah Cameron Harp. He is a K State postdoctoral fellow in agricultural economics, but we're also joined today by his professor, Nathan Hendricks. He's a professor of agricultural economics here at K State. We're continuing that conversation now again, but we're looking more towards the future of these markets as well as some of the interesting policy that could potentially surround them. So, thank you both so much for joining me today. Thanks for having us. Yeah, thank you very much. Absolutely. So, Micah, like I said, we're really continuing our conversation from last week, and we wanted to talk about the future of this new emerging market, but we ran out of time. So we're continuing that now. And we wanted to really talk about the potential for this now voluntary market to potentially turn into something that's no longer voluntary, right? It's a little bit of a concern for some. Yeah. And and this is a question I get very frequently from producers in Kansas, is what We are considering a voluntary market today going to turn into something like a compliance market. And one of the things that I love to tell people is if we look at current policy, it's really indicating to us that the USDA's role is going to be to support the current voluntary private market rather than to try to replace it. The main thing that we've noticed is this Growing Climate Solutions Act of 2022. It's part of the omnibus spending bill. There's really three components to it that intersect with this voluntary market. The first is to establish some programs housed in the USDA, the purpose of which is to help producers understand the different rules that we talked about last week about participating in some of these different programs. The second goal of it is for the USDA to publish some best practices and some materials which really describe the means of adjusting soil carbon levels. And then finally, to direct the USDA and EPA to conduct some research and finally publish a report about what is the current state of these markets and what are some of the barriers and challenges that producers are facing. So, you know, all three of those items there are really about supporting the current voluntary market and enabling producers to participate in it in a well-informed manner, rather than saying, we are going to take over the role of an intermediary or do something like establish a carbon bank. Sure. So instead of intervening in these new markets for agriculture and almost taking over, it's more so introducing resources to help encourage the adoption of some of these practices for our producers here in the U.S. Exactly. And one of the things you just mentioned, which we didn't have time to talk about last week, is the possibility for overlap between this voluntary market and some of our government programs. So one of the examples is EQIP. Nathan, if you wouldn't mind just refreshing us on what EQIP is and the possibility that a producer could, one, receive some type of incentive from the government, but then also be paid for the credits that that generates. Yeah, so EQIP is a program that's uh, through the Farm Bill, and it's paying farmers to implement some environmentally friendly practice. So this is beyond just carbon sequestration, but lots of different types of environmental benefits. But there is programs that are specifically in there for some of these practices like cover crops and and no-till and and so forth. And one of the things that happened these last couple of years is the passage of the Inflation Reduction Act actually put a substantial more amount of money 
into EQIP over the next few years. And the way that Inflation Reduction Act targeted those funds is basically some kind of carbon offset benefits. We don't have a lot of details of how that's going to be implemented yet, but certainly that will be a lot more money flowing through EQIP. But it's different than the voluntary market, right? The way EQIP works is that you're getting a a fixed payment. There's nothing based on quantifying the amount of carbon sequestered. It's usually per acre payments and kind of more evenly distributed and less less on the quantification issues that tend to be more the case in the voluntary market. Great insight there. And, you know, we were talking beforehand and I was asking, you know, some out of the box questions, I think. Thinking about this market, it's a global market, really. We've focused really on largely how it plays out here in the U.S. And I think there's some consequences of that, but also some interesting interactions that could potentially happen. So with it being a global market, what are the chances that there's competition that we see play out maybe between regions, countries, different parts of the agricultural sector? What would that look like? That's a a fantastic question. And what I always like to tell people is, you know, it doesn't matter to the molecule of carbon dioxide where it gets emitted and where it gets sequestered. But it does have a lot of implications for where the producer can sell those credits. So one question you asked is, will we see competition between countries? And I'll, I'll maybe punt that one to Nathan in a second. But I will touch on competition between sectors because last week we talked about forestry being another main provider of carbon credits. And, you know, absolutely, if the price of those uh, forest carbon credits falls, right, we may start to see an increase in demand for those forestry credits, which would pull us away from providing agricultural credits. And fortunately for the agriculture sector, what we've actually seen is a decrease in the perceived quality of forestry carbon credits because there's been some questions about whether they're truly additional, whether the forest that we say that you know we conserved or that we actually improved, whether that would have happened without the incentives that we provided. So that's one of the main sources of competition that I expect will play out in the next couple of years. The other source that Nathan mentioned earlier is actually direct carbon capture. I don't know as much about that except that it is much more expensive expensive because in those instances, we're actually taking carbon out of the atmosphere, turning it into some type of solid immutable form, and then burying it. So because that's much more expensive, we don't see it being immediately competitive, but it very much could be in the long run. Yeah. And between countries, like Micah said, we, we've seen this some in forestry of that countries have are, are paying other countries to promote forestry, though there's been some limitations of that. And one of the main challenges in going across countries is just the ability to regulate what's happening in those other countries. Because all these carbon markets really depends on things like, was it additional? Is the carbon really going to stay in there? And if you're staying within the country, there can kind of become some rules of the game and that regulatory process can overlook that voluntary market. Uh, Once you start going across countries, how do we say what's a real carbon credit and what's not in one country. And, but the other thing is, you know, most of what we've talked about is in crop agriculture. There are opportunities in some of the livestock sector as well. More in the livestock sector, it's it's about reducing emissions. And so especially in California, we're already seeing pretty substantial payments through their programs there for dairies to install these anaerobic digesters that reduce emissions of methane. Absolutely. And that was another out of the box question that I had for you all before we went on air here was what is the potential for this to expand in other environmental concern areas like methane per se? Yeah, right. I think that's definitely an area where there's going to continue to be this this kind of movement. And and in general, what I see is, you know, it's it's also not just about carbon emissions. We're seeing programs pop up for ecosystem services, right, right which is much broader. And so now thinking about water quality improvements and all these things. One of the things that I see about the carbon market that might shift the view of people towards a lot of different things is that a lot of different practices is that they're actually trying to quantify the environmental benefit. All of our environmental programs in the past have always been tied to practices. And this voluntary market's really a first approach at saying not just the practice, but how much carbon sequestered. There could be things like how much water quality improvement occurred. Now, putting dollar values on those is difficult also, but once they start to try to quantify what's the change in environmental quality 
instead of just practice, that's a change that could go over into lots of different spheres and not just carbon. So it's interesting to see as technology evolves and we can pinpoint more exactly how it actually quantifies, it's interesting to see how those industries are all going to overlap and how this is going to evolve over time. So super interesting conversation in a topic area and some really cool research that you guys get to do. Oh, absolutely. We're right now especially excited about some research looking at what happens if we change the scale at which these carbon markets operate. So right now, most of these programs are contracting with individual producers, but what happens if instead you had 20 producers get together and say, we want to market our carbon credits all as one single entity? Or perhaps you do it at the county level or the state level. Well, from the soil science side of things, it's much easier to model the change in carbon at larger scales. Our uncertainty is much smaller. So one of the things that we're studying in the agricultural economics department is what are the overall outcomes as far as the cost efficiency of these markets if we change that scale at which we're examining the problem. So carbon cooperatives of sort is what I'm hearing? <laughs> yeah, there's lots of different ways that it could potentially be implemented. But yeah, that's, that's effectively the idea. Very cool. Well, maybe that's a future discussion we'll have to have here once that research wraps up. Nathan and Micah, I can't thank you both enough for joining us today and answering so many of my wild outside the box questions that I have about this new and emerging area for agriculture. I appreciate it so much. Very happy to be here. Thanks for having us. Absolutely. Once again, everyone, that was Micah Cameron Harp. Again, he's a K-State postdoctoral fellow in agricultural economics here at K-State, as well as a professor of agricultural economics, Nathan Hendricks, joining us for a conversation on the future of carbon markets as well as policies surrounding them. We'll be back with more ahead on Agriculture Today. Today, we are joined now by Brian Lubers. He's an associate professor in K-State's College of Veterinary Medicine, and he serves as a certified veterinary pharmacologist as well. And today, he's joining us to talk about the FDA's antimicrobial use regulations that are quickly approaching. We have, I guess, a set date of June 11th this year, where these deadlines are going to be softly put into place, I think is kind of the term, Brian, that we're going with. Yep. Yeah, I think that's a fair rule. So yeah, so what's happening is, um, and most people are probably aware of this, there's been a lot of public announcements. The FDA is moving all of the remaining over-the-counter antimicrobial, human medically important, we need to make that distinction, the human medically important antimicrobial products, they are moving them to a prescription-only status. Sure. So this is an addition, like you said, this is that last 10% of kind of those antimicrobials that were already regulated through the Veterinary Feed Directive previously. Yeah. So two or three years ago now, I think it was, the Veterinary Feed Directive went fully into place. And so any antimicrobials that go through the feed, those required a Veterinary Feed Directive. Uh, Many of the injectable antimicrobial products that we use have already been prescription status. And so these are just kind of that last percentage and 10% might actually be a high number. Um, It's that just that last remaining. So it's the injectable penicillin products, the injectable tetracycline products, some of them, not all of them, and a few of like oral sulfa products, the things that you can pick up at a farm and feed store that were labeled over the counter. Uh, The FDA is requiring or asking those manufacturers to move them from an over-the-counter status to a prescription status, just like all the other injectable products that we currently use. Sure, absolutely. And I guess when, you know, we talk about this subject with most people, their first conversation is, well, why now? Yeah. And um, so this is actually part of a about a five to six year process now that the FDA is moving forward on. And then kind of one of the initial pieces of that was the veterinary feed directive changes that we, we've we talked about and have gone through. Uh, but they had in 2018, a five-year stewardship plan in veterinary settings. Um, and they're also doing some things on the human side as well. Um, obviously, you know, on the human side, if you need antimicrobials that goes through your physician, that goes through your pharmacist. So those steps are kind of already in play on that. And so uh, there, it's not solely focusing on veterinary medicine, but this is one area where it was part of their kind of their longer term plan to uh, make sure that when we're using antimicrobials in veterinary medicine, that we're doing it in a judicious manner. And, and in some cases, um, that might be 
your veterinarian may say, you know, really an antimicrobial in this situation isn't appropriate. It's probably not providing you any benefit. Um, it might be that in some cases they say, yeah, that's the appropriate way to move forward and, and we're going to continue that. Or they might change it to an antimicrobial that they think might be more effective. So I think, you know, we tend to look at these regulations in a kind of a negative light, like it's, oh, it's more paperwork, it's more, you know, it's more regulation. But I think there will be some situations where having that oversight by a veterinarian actually provides some benefit back to the producer as far as, you know, you, you still are going to have the cost of an antimicrobial, but it might be you're using one that's more effective and you get better outcomes. So I'd encourage people to really try to look at it in that light, like we're using the best product in the right situations. Sure, absolutely. And my next question is, what is this process now going to look like? Like we said, the, this set date is June 11th. It's coming up quickly here in two months or so. So what will the process now look like when you're interacting with a veterinarian from here on out about antimicrobials? Yeah, so so the the heart of the process is from the FDA's perspective is they're just cha- the manufacturers are changing the label. So on the label previously, it says over the counter. Now it's going to say prescription only, right? And so the process looks just like it does for any other prescription product we use. Veterinary feed directive is a slightly different process, but if you needed an injectable product right now that's currently a prescription product, and again, most of them are, the process will look exactly the same for these products starting after June 11th. And what the FDA has said they're going to do is, you know, there's a lot of over-the-counter labeled stock out there, and they're not going to ask people to to pull that off the shelves right away. They're just going to let that deplete over time. And so any new products that are being manufactured will have that prescription-only label. So really what it means is the producer has to have a relationship with a veterinarian, and we call that the veterinary client-patient relationship. And then together, that veterinarian and producer work together to determine which antimicrobial they'll use in a particular situation, what the dose is, what the withdrawal time is, you know, a lot of the things that are on the label. Um, so that'll be part of the discussion. But but really, you just have to have a veterinarian either authorize a prescription or actually distribute, you know, they authorize a prescription and they sell the drug to you. So they distribute the drug to you. So um, it, like I said, if you're using any other prescription product, it'll look exactly the same as that. One of the things I think of with vet med is, you know, a lot of the things that happen aren't planned, obviously. Like you don't plan for an animal to get sick. You don't hope for that. But things do happen. So say you have a desperately ill animal and your vet is two to three hours away, depending on your location. This doesn't mean that you have to wait for your vet to have time and their schedule to come out and look at your animal, right? I'll say actually a lot of what we do is planned as far as having treatment protocols, right? So we don't necessarily plan for the animal to get sick, but we like to have a plan in place that says, you know, if we have an animal that has this disease, this is what the treatment is. And we call those treatment protocols and the veterinarian and the producer work together to put those in place. And so um, as long as you have that in place and you have the valid veterinary client patient relationship, which varies a little bit from state to state, there's a federal definition that some states use. In Kansas, we use that definition. Uh, But it basically describes that relationship as as a veterinarian, I understand enough about your operation and the animals on that operation and the disease challenges that you have that I can make a preliminary diagnosis and say, yeah, that is that disease. And yes, that is an appropriate antimicrobial therapy. But nowhere in the regulations does it require, I don't have to examine every single animal in order to authorize that prescription. Now, as part of good practice, we typically want to follow up in those situations. You know, if we're not available immediately, um, we want to follow up. And certainly if, if the particular clinical situation, it doesn't fit exactly what I think it is as a veterinarian, um, I'm, I'm probably going to say, you know, go ahead and start therapy. Um, but I, I need to come out and examine these animals just to verify that we really are dealing with whatever disease we suspect. Like you said, in, in those situations where it's not an exact fit. That's not a change, right? That's how things have kind of always been. It's all, yeah, it's been that way for really since the passage of the Animal Medicinal Drug Use Clarification Act clear back in 1996. So we've we've worked under this structure for a long, long time. It's just now it will include all of the medically important antimicrobials. 
Sure. And you mentioned this earlier, kind of the purchasing now of these antimicrobials, how it'll go from this point forward. And you're not strictly having to purchase just from a veterinarian in these situations, right? No, the regulations don't require you purchase directly from the veterinarian. Um, You know, a lot of times how that how the logistics of that work really comes down to the individual veterinarian and producer. Um, You know, we have examples of veterinarians that only authorize prescriptions and they sell no antimicrobials at all. And then so uh, the, the producer has to source those through a distributor, right? The veterinarian writes a prescription, sends it to the distributor, they get it to the producer. Um, We have examples of veterinarians that, they sell a lot of the antimicrobials that they authorize and then everything in between. So, but no, it doesn't require that. It just requires that from a producer's perspective, you have to have that veterinary client patient relationship in place so that the veterinarian can legally write the prescription for whatever the most appropriate antimicrobial would be. Absolutely. And we've talked about the subject a lot from a producer perspective, you know, addressing a lot of their concerns. But from a veterinarian perspective, what are some of the changes now that you think will kind of affect how that works today? Um, and again, probably probably minimal for most veterinarians. Um, it may mean that they have to carry a little more inventory um, if if their producer clients, you know, so for example, if their producer clients are used to purchasing these products from the farm and feed store or wherever it is, veterinarians might have to carry a little more inventory or veterinarians may just decide that we're going to, we're going to script out more of this. If they don't want to handle the inventory, uh, they may say, we're just going to script more of this out. And so from their perspective, you know, they're all right, already writing some prescriptions. There's probably a little additional paperwork for more prescriptions. But again, I, you know, the usage of these products in comparison to everything else we've already done, it's pretty small. So there will be a little administrative burden. There might be some inventory burden. Uh, but again, it's not a completely new process. It's just adding on to what we already do in large part. Absolutely. Well, Brian, I can't thank you enough for joining us again. I know we've talked about this in the past before already on the show, but we just wanted to put a reminder out there because that date is approaching once again, and it will be kind of a slow adjustment that occurs, but good reminders nonetheless. Yep. Yep. And thanks for having me. Absolutely. Always appreciate it. Absolutely. Well, I'll link to some of the resources as well that we've talked about in the past, some great ones from the FDA. So be sure to check that out in our show notes, which can be found on agtoday.net as always. But once again, everyone, that was Associate Professor in K-State's College of Veterinary Medicine, Brian Lubers, joining us for a conversation on the FDA's antimicrobial use regulations. As always, if you are on the go and listening to us on the radio with one of our radio station partners, be sure to check out our podcast. We are available as a podcast anywhere podcasts can be found. Simply search for Agriculture Today and you should find us there. So that's Apple Podcasts, Spotify, Google Podcasts. Once again, anywhere podcasts can be found. And that's also where the show notes for today's program can also be found with all of the available links that are discussed during today's programming. We're cutting to a short break now, but we'll be back with more ahead on Agriculture Today. You're listening to Agriculture Today over the K-State Radio Network. Along with Samantha Bennett, I'm Jeff Wickman. We end today's program with this week's Milk Lines. Flies in the dairy barn are not only a nuisance for both cows and humans, they can have a negative economic impact by reducing milk production as cows expand extra energy fending them off, cause poor general health, and even reduce worker productivity. K-State Dairy Specialist Mike Brook says that reducing the fly population in early spring can help keep the population down as we move into late spring and summer. Today he looks at some of the methods that can be used to control flies in early spring. Today I want to visit with our Kansas dairy farmers concerning fly season. Yes, it's official. I killed my first fly yesterday, so game on. So, how about on your dairy? Are you ready? Have you been preparing? We've talked about some things a few weeks ago to get ready for it, but hey, guess what? It's here, like it or not, and it'll just get worse as we get a little deeper into the spring. So, what are some early measures that you maybe need to think about? You know, early on in the battle with the flies, it's really about just controlling the number of adult flies that are out there. So what are some very efficient ways to do that? Yeah, on the home, the fly swatter works great, but maybe not so much when we get out on our dairy. So early in the season, 
Some of you may use parasitic wasps. Those are great. You just have to put them out every week. Some of you probably are maybe adding a feed additive, an insecticide, to your animal's feed every day that's approved by FDA for use in dairy cows. If you haven't started that and that was going to be part of your game plan, you need to get on it ASAP. We really don't want those adult levels of flies to start building on your dairy. And the insecticide is very effective in helping control that. Now, one of the challenges with the insecticide route is the fact that if you have other livestock located within a mile of your dairy, it may not be very effective just because flies do move from place to place. And if others around you are not controlling flies as well, may limit the amount that we can control either with insecticides or even with the parasitic wasp. Some other things that you might think about doing. Maybe you haven't tried these. If you haven't, I suggest you give it a try this year. So baits. Baits can be highly, highly effective, particularly early in the season. Nice thing about baits is you put them out and they're there for a while. So you do have to go back and refill them because they will be used over time. Some of the newer baits actually go into feeders that are refillable, or you can get the type that you just tack up and then have to remove and replace with a new one if they get to the point where they really don't have much of the material left in them. So baits can be very helpful around the uh, housing barns for our lactating animals and can be used some areas in our calves. You know, some simple things we can sometimes do early in the season that are helpful are just fly strips in our buildings. Those are highly effective and they will catch flies and that reduces the number of adult flies we have on our farm. So if we don't overwhelmed with flies, those can be very helpful early in the season as well. One last thing I'd like to suggest if you haven't tried these are the fly traps. You know, some of the places you might try to utilize those are around your calves, particularly if you have calves in hutches. And in a lot of us, we have trees, and those are great windbreaks, but they also harbor a lot of flies. So if you have some trees, a shelter belt around where you have your calf hutches, you might consider putting some of these bait traps just at the edge of that. They're highly effective. They'll catch a lot of flies. And again, early in the fly season, it's an opportunity for you to keep the fly populations down. This will delay some of the more drastic measures that we have to use a little bit later in the season. And the longer we can delay starting the spraying, likely the better overall fly control program we will have. This is Mike Brook with K-State Research and Extension, encouraging our dairy farmers to get after the flies. Fly season is here. Thanks, Mike. That's K-State Dairy Specialist Mike Brook with information on controlling flies in early spring. And that'll do it for this edition of Agriculture Today. For Samantha Bennett, I'm Jeff Wickman. This is the K-State Radio Network.